Welcome to a brand new episode of Ghoulish. I am Max Booth, a host. And today on the program, I am talking to an award winning voice actor, a narrator, a dialect coach. I am talking to Linda Jones, a professional audiobook narrator, folks. She has done so many awesome audiobooks in the whole genre, including a brand new audiobook of a book that came out last year called We Need to Do Something by me, Max Booth, a host. She did the audio recording of the book, and I gotta tell you, it's pretty awesome. It's available now in, uh, uh, what's that fucking website called? Audible. Yeah. So, you know, if you, if you listen to audiobooks and you want to listen to an audiobook about a family stuck in the bathroom during a tornado rolling and also maybe uh those witches involved and uh deep fakes and uh spooky dog tongues maybe go give we need to do something a listen and you could listen to uh linda jones read it you could also listen to linda jones answer my questions on this very episode of ghoulish with me max booth a host. So let's get right on into the program, shall we? Okay, let's do it. Let's get on. Let's do, let's listen to the episode right now. <laughs> We're gonna listen to the episode. <laughs> <coughs> How you doing? Oh my God, you sound so professional. <laughs> Is it okay? Does it sound okay? Yes, it sounds great. <laughs> okay, you good. sound like you might be in some type of a uh, recording booth. I am in a recording booth. Wow, how come no one, no one else does this when I have them on the show? You need to uh, improve your quality of guest? I don't know. <laughs> I guess so, yeah. I mean, usually they just do it at home like a like a slob, but you went out <laughs> of your way to, I guess, rent this booth only to do my podcast? Is that right? Yes, it's just for you. I hope I do not receive an invoice. It's on the way. Okay, well... <laughs> it's in the mail. <laughs> Hopefully the check is in the mail, too. I uh, do not open mail when it arrives. I just go, ah, well, if I don't open it, then it means I did not receive it, and I just exactly. throw it in the trash. <laughs> so good luck with that. I want to begin with audiobooks, and I also want to end with audiobooks because that is the, the topic of the episode. I don't see us going beyond audiobooks. Okay. I was going to ask what's in the middle. If we're beginning and ending with, <laughs> with audiobooks. <laughs> That's impossible to guess. Yes. Okay. What was your first experience with audiobooks? Not just recording, but listening to them. This has been coming up a lot. Uh, people say, you know, what, what did you first hear? And what I always answer is Vincent Price reading ghost stories. They were great. And I still have the vinyl album I had when I was a kid. Um, my dad would pick up Cadman records for us, which were mostly spoken word. Um, and I don't remember most of them, but the ones that I loved were the Vincent Price ghost stories. And we pull it out every Halloween and listen to it. So that was sort of my first experience listening. What do you think you love so much about those? He takes you into the story. You forget your listening actor and you're just in this story. It's, it's. It's the joy of having someone tell you a story. And we get that from when we're little kids and our parents read to us, hopefully. Um, and it's it's wonderful. It's just this kind of joyful thing. You you depart for a while and, and get to live somewhere else. Wow. I want to go back a few minutes ago to when you said uh, people keep asking you this question. Now, are you talking about a different interviews or do you just run into this question on the street both um i have i mean not that i'm doing a whole lot of interviews but but i've seen it come up in in social media people say how did you get how did you start what was your first audiobook experience not necessarily directed specifically to me just sort of a, a question for the general public 
So it's something that I've been thinking about. Why is everybody so nosy? Ask social media. But then I would be I would be the problem <laughs> too. I would be asking the question. Uh-huh. Ah, it's a uh, what do you call it? A catch fifty five. <laughs> I uh, before I said that I thought oh it would be highly amusing if I said catch fifty five and then I said it <laughs> and I realized it wasn't amusing but also I still stand by it. Strong choice. Thank you. I uh, <laughs> this podcast is all about making strong choices. Seriously. <laughs> what do you think I could do to make my sound quality? Like Phil Sibel, how do I sound? Do I am I coming across a crystal? You sound coil? great to me. Yeah. I've got my I've got my headphones on. Um, you sound clear and Yeah, it sounds good. I always have an issue with uh having a dry mouth and making that popping noise. Mm -hmm. and I, I don't know, Everybody has that. I don't know what to do about that. You would think chugging a coffee constantly before recording would help, <laughs> but it doesn't seem to help me. Um, that's one of those never-ending narrator questions. Everybody has, everybody's got mouth noise to some extent, and every body is different. Some people have it worse than other people, but everybody has it a little bit. And it changes, like... It's worse for me early in the morning. Um, it gets better as the day goes on. Hydration, drinking a lot of water, um, eating a eating an apple helps. Some some people say eating a green apple. Um, <laughs> seriously, as you recoil, that's going to be an awful audio. <laughs> no, but it cleans your teeth and it gets your it, because not all mouth noise is created by dry mouth, but a lot of it is. Um, things sticking to each other and gumming up and so if you can lubricate not to get too graphic but um drinking water and and eating eating a sour apple really helps wow apples i'm gonna do that mm -hmm. usually yeah. i'm s sitting behind this mic with my mouth just wide open because i'm afraid <laughs> of opening and closing it and i i assume i look psychotic and that's another thing. I mean, I used I, I taught voiceover for a company called Edge Studios here in New York City for eight years. And one of the things you learn, both as you're doing voiceover and as you're as you're telling other people how to do it, is don't open and close your mouth a lot, because otherwise you end up with smacking. Do you have any uh, tips for keeping a mouth open, like perhaps some type of a mouth contraption to install? <laughs> I, have, I have no contraption. No? Okay. I didn't <laughs> know if you could buy with, that. Get comfortable with mouth breathing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do you uh, have, we'll have issues? I have this issue sometimes. So I, uh, I don't know how close to be to my mic, and sometimes I hit my face on it. <laughs> Does that happen to you? It has not happened to me. Oh. I have bumped the mic, like if I'm, because yeah. I, I try to use body language when I'm working, and if I've got my, my hands up in the air or something, I have, like, bumped the mic arm. Do you uh, have any good, like, uh, mic jokes? I'll give you an, <laughs> I'll give you an example. I have this funny uh, gag, and only, that's only in my head that I will tell you now of having my own talk show one day mm -hmm. and uh, doing an, uh, an open mic night. And then yeah. you show up and it's just this guy named Mike who has been uh, ripped open. <laughs> I, I can't top that. I don't know what to do with this. I mean, no one's going to let me rip someone open. It, can it be fake? It would have to be a real thing. Well, I would it would. It would have to be real. Yeah, I would lose respect if it was yeah. faked. It's How true. How did you get into audiobooks? Um, well, I started as an actor. I decided I wanted to be an actor when I was 10. And my parents were like, oh, okay. Um, and then I went to school for it. I have a degree in acting from Ithaca College in upstate New York uh, from the 80s. And I've been an actor for 30 years, um, primarily theater and music. But I've also done a little film and television in the early aughts. I started getting into voiceover um, and fully into voiceover starting around 2007, 2008, which is also sort of when I started teaching it. Um, and the studio that I was working at, Edge Studio, invited me to audition for this audiobook project they were, do they were doing. It was a full cast 
directed in studio audiobook. And so I went in and they had me audition for a couple of different characters and I booked one. Um, and that was my first experience. That was my very first audiobook. And it was kind of a great way to start because I wasn't sitting by myself alone in a booth. I was actually working with people who knew what they were doing, which was great. How strange do you think it is that right now you will sitting in a booth and I am also a booth. <laughs> it's pretty, uh, are you in a booth? Odd. No, but my last name is booth. Oh yes. Sorry. Yeah. That's okay. Got it. The audience <laughs> will know what I'm talking about. They will go, aha, that was a, uh-huh. that was a great observation, Max. What a great <laughs> follow up to this interesting answer that Linda just gave. Wow. <laughs> I'm not quick enough. So this was 2008, you said? 2007? I think that was actually 2011. Oh. I had gotten into voiceover, but, but audiobooks I hadn't started yet. I started, I think, when did that come out? I'm looking at it right now. Yeah, it came out in fall of 2011. Okay, so how did you move on from uh, doing this multi nil or uh recording to, I mean, you do audiobooks for a living now, right? So... Mm-hmm. What is that like? What was the journey like from Phil? Because it's been a decade since then. It has been. And I didn't do it full time at first. It was sort of, I reached out to a contact I had at Audible, uh, Audible Studios. Their their official studios are in Newark, New Jersey. Um, and I had a contact through a friend of a friend, reached out. They brought me into audition and they brought me in to do probably half a dozen uh, titles for them over the course of three or four years. That was between 2012 and 2015. Um, So it was still really sporadic. Um, And then I took a break. I mean, and and at the time I was doing other voiceover as well, and I'm still doing other voiceover as well. Um, But in 2015, I kind of took a break from doing audiobooks I had stuff going on. We were moving. There was life stuff happening. And I just sort of stepped back. Um, In 2018, eh, 2017, 2018, I started to really take a look at it again um, and took a look at the Audio Publishing Association. Uh, They have an annual conference that a lot of narrators go to and a lot of publishers go to. Um, Started networking, started coaching again. I hooked up with a couple of really good audiobook coaches to make sure I knew what I was doing. Um, especially since I opened my profile on ACX, which is how you and I produced our book, um, and started looking at doing it on my own. Um, when you're working with a publisher, they bring you in, they give you the title, you prep the book, you come in, you read it. There's an engineer recording you. You don't have to worry about anything. You just read the book and then you go home. When you're doing it yourself, there's a lot more to the process. Um, So I wanted to make sure that I knew what I was doing, that I was on the right track, that my choices were good, that I was sort of living in the world of, of audiobooks, which is its own particular style. So I hooked up with some coaches, set up my profile and sort of put myself out there. While I was sort of ramping up into this again, there's a wonderful author named Lauren Davis, who you may know from social media. I don't know. Um, She had a beautiful book called The Grimoire of Kensington Market. She reached out to me to find out, do I do audiobooks? Is this something that I might be interested in? Um, I had taken a piece of it for a for an audiobook workshop I was doing, so I had already asked her about it. Um, so she asked me to send an audition to her. She forwarded it on to Recorded Books. They said yes. She said yes. And so my next sort of book was through a publisher. And then I started doing it on my own. Does that, does that all make sense, or am I just rambling? Uh, both. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> People say rambling in a negative way, but I don't think that's a, a bad thing at all. 
I'm trying to piece it all together like on a timeline, and I'm not particularly concise doing it. If you asked me to tell you how I got to what I'm doing right now, it would sound like madness. <laughs> so I think you did That's a, kind of the best way to get there. I think you did a good job. I am interested in the, I guess, the grittiness of <laughs> the grittiness of making an audio book. How often do you? I guess I've done live readings, and mm-hmm. after about twenty seconds, I'm like, okay, I'm sick of this. <laughs> how much do you do in one session how often are you doing breaks how often are you stopping to make fun of what you are reading to the engineer <laughs> um just jumping back you probably don't want to be an audiobook narrator then if you're if you're sick of your own voice after 20 seconds um it depends on the project um some books are really really easy and fast And so I find myself able to do long sessions and move through them quickly. Others, like a nonfiction, can be more dense and challenging. Um, And you stumble more and you make more mistakes and you have to go back. And um, and you and you may do you may do the same length session and just not end up with as much usable material. Or you may do shorter sessions. Sometimes I find myself getting tired, so I'll cut the session short. Other times I'm feeling great and and I can go for hours. Um, I try to on a on a on a really strong day, if I'm working on a book and I'm and you know I'm on a deadline and things are going well, I might record for four hours with a break in there. Um, and end up with two hours of usable material, of two finished hours. Yeah. Do you have a lot of uh, outtakes going on as well? Not not really outtakes, because I'm sitting by myself, so, you know, I can't make jokes. Well, I can, but I'm the only one laughing. (laughs) And I do. (laughs) I mean, there are times when I say something ridiculous that I do laugh, but mostly it's just, you know, you get halfway down a page and you stumble over something or you, you know, and then you go back, you set your, you know, I'm recording in a program called Pro Tools. I set the cursor back and and take it again. I am someone who cannot pronounce uh, most things in the English language. Uh, so I'm wondering, do you have like certain things that you dread having to read out loud? Grasp. The word grasp. Oh, and the word digital. Now I just said it okay, but if I if it comes across in a in a script or in a I can't say it. Digital. D- digital. I <laughs> I'm not even going to try to say it. There's a reason why I've never said that out loud in my life. Grasp, clasp, all those. Like when they're in when when they're in a sentence, it's really hard. Is it easy or no no difficult when it's past tense? grasped depends on it depends on where it falls in a sentence she grasped what did i i had something that i was complaining to other narrators about there are narrator groups um let's get let's get into that tell me all about these groups (laughs) oh i can't tell you any secrets um no it's just where people you know bitch and moan and put up their their hardest phrase of the day you know things like that i had to say this today now, I, I assume, I haven't done the intro to this episode yet, but I assume Feature Max is intelligent enough to bring up the fact that you did the audio on my book, We Need to Do Something. So yes. now I'm hoping you had some complaint about something I wrote into this group, perhaps about eating a tongue or something of that nature. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, because I live with a horror writer. Ah, yes, that's true. I knew what to expect. Okay. I mean, not exactly. You are your own voice. You are a unique writer. But I've done horror before. Quite a bit. Yeah. That, that um, is how I found you, because you did the... Well, I, okay, that's not true. I was going to say I, I became a real of you after seeing that you did the audio of... Uh, of a, of a book that I can't mm-hmm. think of now, Cross something, <laughs> Cross, what is that book? Cross, uh, Lil and Hightail's book. 
Oh yeah, Crossroads. Oh, Crossroads. Oh, beautiful. Jesus. Laurel. Yeah. Yeah, but obviously, I've you and I have known each other a long time due to yeah, yeah, a yeah. mutual acquaintance. You you were the first publisher that that John worked with. Yeah, that's right. Dead Men. Dead Men by John C. Fossil. When nice. I when I got his book in the slush pile, I was so excited. It was like, oh fuck. I just, I just scheduled somebody good, which was not a thing that happened off and still does not happen often. <laughs> I uh, no longer will know what I was going to say. Um, well, we were talking about working on your book and I was talking about working with horror writers. Oh, yes. I didn't have a question. That's right. <laughs> um, let's talk about uh, my book. Let's be selfish. Okay. Yeah. So uh, tell me what you, uh, what went into recording this book specifically? Did you have to do anything different? Did you have to? Uh... I did. Yeah. Okay. What? I actually did. Um, well, first of all, it's a younger character than I usually play. So that's why I was really, when I first sent you the first 15, I was like, is he going to like this? Is this, you know, because I have a fairly deep voice and I always have I had when I was a kid too um teenager but it wasn't quite right for your main character so I had to find who is this character not not that I was putting on a voice because that's all that always sounds silly but to find who she is what her energy is who the other characters are um so that was a challenge and then there was more dialogue in this book than in most books I've done. There was a huge amount of dialogue, which makes sense because it's four people trapped in a bathroom. Um, and that was great. But what I ended up doing was normally I'm sitting in a booth that is, I don't know, four by four. It's not a huge amount of space. And I have a stool in here and I sit on my, my stool and I talk into a microphone. I moved the stool out. I did your book standing because I needed to be, I don't know, I needed to be on my feet. I needed that kind of energy. It's a frenetic book. One thing I was concerned about before uh, listening to the audio that you made was, mm -hmm. yeah, there was a lot of dialogue, but also I try not to use dialogue tags. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think about how that might sound in an audiobook until after I sent it to you. Mm -hmm. But I was pleasantly surprised that it was really easy to follow along still. You were doing some pretty cool uh I don't even I don't even want to say voices, but what would you how would you describe that because the voices do sound slightly different. I'm playing characters. I mean that sounds pretentious, but that's Rather than thinking of it as coming up with different voices, I just try to channel the characters. Who is this person? Who is this person? And they're, you wrote them. They're all different. They're four very different people trapped in this room together. So they, they're going to sound different. Um, and that it's still always scary when there's no dialogue tags, but it's also kind of wonderful not having that because... You get bogged down with it. He said, she said, he said, she laughed. He grimaced. He, you know, you know, a lot. I'm not a, a fan of, of dialogue tags at all. So many times you don't need them. There are so many times when, when it's easier just to get rid of them. Okay, so it seems you already noticed this about dialogue tags. What else have you noticed while recording all of these audiobooks? That will, they, it sounds essentially like, like you might have some writing advice for people listening. There's something that John does that is really useful for narrators. <laughs> um, not that he's doing it for narrators, but he always reads his books aloud. At one point in the process, and it's usually late in the process, it's been through several drafts, um, so he's getting, you know, he's sort of in the final stages before he's sending it out to to agents and publishers. But he'll sit and read it aloud. Um, and that's when he notices a lot of the dialogue tags that don't need to be there or things that are just clunky. But but just the act of reading it aloud forces him to think about it in a different way. 
Yeah, I do the the same thing with dialogue only though. I don't think mm-hmm. I, I don't think I've read like a whole book out, but I definitely read out conversations mm-hmm. to to get the flow correctly. Yeah. It really helps. Absolutely. I think anyone listening to this who also writes, you would mm-hmm. you would benefit from doing mm-hmm. that. And also hiring Linda Jones to recall that yeah. the audiobook when you finish. <laughs> How would they do that? What would they need to do? Go to my website, send me an email. Um I'm at www.lindajonesonline.com. All right. Um, That's easy. <laughs> and my email is there and my phone number and my there's a contact form, however you prefer to reach out. Um, but all my social media addresses are there as well. So I'm, I'm easy to find. Um, and I'm always interested. <laughs> have, you, <laughs> have you had to decline a project for any reason? Like it was just, ah, oh, no, this writing's awful. I'm not doing this. I've declined audition offers um, that are, you know, like, we have this cookbook we are interested in. in no, I'm not going <laughs> to. It's silly. It's not going to sell. Um, it's not. I've I've declined auditions that seem like I don't know why they came to me um, because it's it's clearly I don't know the there was one that I'm thinking of that was a, a, a sales book that was it just, I'm not the right narrator for it. What are you most interested in then? I love doing dark fiction, whether it's horror or mysteries and thrillers and all of it. That's what I read. That's what I love. Do you have um, a, a previously published book that you would just love to have a chance to do an audiobook on? Oh my god. Yeah. Um I really want to do Megan Abbott's Queen Pen. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I have no idea. I don't even know. Uh, she's astonishing, of course. Yes. Her writing. I love Megan awesome. Abbott. Yeah. Her her writing is amazing, especially that I I love all of it, but I love that early noir stuff. Um Queen Pen is my favorite of those books. And it was, I think, Simon & Schuster that mm. published it. I have no idea. And her later books are with Hachette, I believe. I could be wrong on all of it. So I don't even know who has the audio rights for it. But it has never been made into an audiobook, And it needs to be. It's so good. I think we can make that happen, right? I mean, how how difficult oh, could that be? Who who do we contact? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. If anyone's listening, they can make I have this a happen. Sample on my website. Yes. I have a sample of her book of Queen Pen in my audiobook samples. Well, we anyone listening go listen to this <laughs> sample. Uh, I don't know. Email it, Megan. Uh, maybe she's listening to this episode i don't think so. i don't think so but maybe <laughs> <laughs> all right well i think that about does it did you have anything else you wanted to include or bring up i don't think so unless there's something i've forgotten i didn't i was gonna write down some notes and then i said no i'll just wing it i think the same thing every time i go to do one of these episodes i think oh yeah. i'm gonna spend some time and come up with questions so i don't seem like I'm unprepared. And guess what? I wrote down nothing. <laughs> but you still seem prepared, so... Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, it's your show. You get to run it however you want. That is true. I haven't recalled one of these since November, so I was I was off. But I don't think You've I was. You've been busy. Yeah. You've been busy. I do have one thing I want to bring up about audio. I've always yeah. I've always wondered this mostly because I wanted to include it in a book, but I the research I haven't been too positive on. Mm-hmm. Eggshell curtains. If I staple them around a room, would that soundproof it? Not really. Damn. They're not that great. Um, it's sort of a myth. Um, they will keep. There are two things that happen when you're when you're working with sound or trying to create a a sound booth or whatever. I now have a professional booth, but I didn't always. Um, There is keeping sound out and there's keeping reverberations from bouncing around, creating a dead space. And those are two different things. The eggshell cartons might help a little with 
keeping sound from bouncing around. It might help deaden the space. It won't keep anything out. Um, the only thing that really keeps out sound, like trucks and airplanes and people shouting and the TV from the other room, is mass, is is heavy walls and, you know, lead. <laughs> oh, well, that's not going to help me. I don't have those. Right. <laughs> um, but the but the further you can get away, the 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 heavier a room you can get into and the further away from the sound you can get, the better. Okay. Um, so. Eggshell cartons won't work, but moving blankets help. Okay. That's a Moving blankets are something that a lot of voice actors use. Interesting. I guess doing this next to a window is probably not a good idea. Windows are terrible. Yeah. Windows leak a lot. Although, you know, like I have a double paned window in my office and it's not, it's not awful. Um, I'm in a Studio Bricks booth, an actual booth that I that I got over the summer, um, and it has really helped. It, I mean, it's designed for this um, because before I actually had to, when I was recording uh, in the space I had before, I had to wait for airplanes. Yeah, I have that issue when I do this podcast. I live next yeah. to a base, so there's mm -hmm. constant oh, jets going around my house in the morning. Oh. So I just try not to do it until <laughs> the sun goes down, I guess. <laughs> yeah. These aren't these these airplanes are kind of far away, so it wasn't too bad, but you know, you wait fifteen seconds and then start again. But it's a it it screws up your rhythm, so Right. I imagine it's... doing audiobooks, you really do get into that rhythm like any like any uh, thespian. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and you have to. If you don't, it's gonna you're gonna hear it in the final product. Right, like uh, saying it's going to be okay five hundred times. <laughs> <laughs> As I sit in my booth, rocking back and forth. <laughs> I. You know, it's so funny on that because I thought the first time I did it, I cut it short. Yeah. And then I thought, why am I cutting it short? First of all, I didn't ask you. I I ought to be doing your words. Do the words. So I went back and I did all of them and then you came back to me and said yeah it's too long <laughs> <laughs> it didn't even occur to me until after you sent it and i thought oh shit how is this gonna sound this is gonna be way too long i didn't know and it might have been i think you actually had to probably hear it mm, yeah probably so to, to make sure yeah it's too long okay let's cut it I've even but. I've even had that complaint in book reviews that it goes too long <laughs> <laughs> because at, on an ebook I bet you it looks like the book is broken because he keeps <laughs> tapping and nothing changes. No, I kind of love that though. Yeah, thank you. All you, right. you get the point across. Yeah, it's gonna be okay. Uh -huh. And that's a good way to uh, end this episode. It's going to be okay. Be okay. Go, yes. go buy the audiobook of We Need to Do Something by me, Max Booth, narrated by you, Linda Jones. Soon to be a major motion picture. Yeah, that's so great to say. I know. It? I'm so excited. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, folks, that was Linda Jones talking about audiobooks and my audiobook of We Need to Do Something by me, Max Booth, narrated by Linda Jones, available now in Audible. Well, if you don't like to listen to books, you can just go and buy a copy. You can buy a signed paperback through perpetualpublishing.com. I also publish all types of other books, not by just me, but by many folks, like Jessica Leonard. Go pick up Antioch. Go pick up Stan Lim by Paul Michael Anderson. Go pick all the books up. Go pick up Dead Men by John C. Foster. Books, books, books. Books! Patreon.com slash PMM Publishing. Yes. Yes. Yes! Spooky, die spooky!